So Dave and George are teaching a class on the future of education, which is very exciting. The two of them should probably never be allowed to collaborate with one another for fear of the universe coming to an end. But uh, they've asked us to submit some thoughts on the future of education. And so I want to give a very contrarian uh, view, one that I don't entirely believe, but which uh, may be credible anyway, about where education is heading. The first point I want to make is that companies want to continue to be in the business that companies are in. They want to make computers, they want to print books, they want to sell hamburgers, they want to mend clothing, they, they want to be in the business it is that they're in. And in as much as we're seeing lots of specialization and outsourcing happening in the marketplace right now, I can't believe that in the near future any company is going to get into the business of also reviewing e-portfolios and reviewing giant aggregations of student work or potential employee work in order to judge their appropriateness uh, as future employees. I think that businesses are going to want uh, to continue down this outsourcing path and continue working in the way that they have for the last several decades, that is outsourcing the function of identif identifying people with minimal uh, relevant skill for the job uh, that they have an opening for, and the way that they're going to do that is they're going to look for signals from universities in the form of degrees. Um, so I say all that just to say that I don't think that uh, universities or degrees uh, are going anywhere in the near future because they'll continue to be uh, the foundation upon which the vast majority of corporate hiring uh, is built upon. So having said that, uh, let's look backward momentarily for a moment. Uh, 1200 years, uh, 12 to 1300 years BC, uh, particularly in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we can see an example of Moses calling the people together and uh, commanding them that every seven years they should come together to listen to a lecture. They should come together to hear the law read so that they can remember the law, learn the law, know the law. Um, hard to live it if you're not aware of it. But here we have. Uh, um, more than a millennium before uh, the birth of Christ, we have a lecture being set up and a commandment, in fact, that people will attend lectures. So the lecture is a very old format. Let me talk just a moment about the lecture. Uh, so starting at least in Moses, you may have earlier examples. We can look forward a couple of hundred years to the fourth century BC uh, when Plato founds the academy and lectures on a number of topics, including a lecture on the good uh, skipping ahead again in the fourth century AD, we have uh, records, the first records of learners actually taking notes during lectures. Uh, skipping ahead a few hundred years more in the 13th century, uh, we see a widespread uh, belief that pedagogically uh, writing out textbooks by hand or writing out classics by hand is uh, very powerful. And so a slower form of the lecture in which a person stands at the front of the room at the lectern with a very large and expensive book placed on the lectern, then proceeds to uh, give a very slow lecture, or which was known as a dictation, so that students could make their own hand copies of these books that were important to them. Uh, in the 14th century, we can see stationers or, or publishers in Paris begin renting out uh, popular books that are used in schools, not rented out for you to take to class, but rented out for you to take home and uh, at your leisure hand copy your own copy of that book. Because in the 14th century universities also began, uh, began to ban the practice of dictations. In the 15th century we've got Gutenberg, printing press, movable type, all of these, metallic movable type, all these pieces coming together. Um, however, you would expect that in a system where the vast majority of pedagogical practice has been around reading books to people so that they could write them by hand, uh, because there's really no other way to get access to them, you would think that when inexpensive books became available to them, that this would significantly alter practice within the classroom. But as uh, you know, this isn't what happened. In fact, in the 16th century, we saw uh, new editions of books used in universities called lecture texts. These were books that were printed with very wide margins on the side because while you didn't need the faculty to stand at the front and read very slowly to you so you could hand copy the entire book yourself, uh, what's a faculty member going to do? Instead, they stand at the front of the room and read their annotations 
of the text to you, hence the very wide margins in the lecture texts where you can copy verbatim the annotations that the faculty member is reading to you. Um, in the 18th century uh, at Harvard, actually, we see one of the first known examples of students being required to purchase a particular text from a particular publisher uh, for use in their own classes there. And then, of course, in the 20th century, we get uh, tiny things like the internet uh, and computers coming along. All this to say that if the invention of the book and metallical, uh, metallic movable print and the printing press was not enough to interfere with the lecture format, which it does not seem to have done, then there is no good reason for us to believe that the internet or any other technology can ever interfere with a lecture format meaningfully. So one vision of the future of education is one in which universities continue to award degrees as objective third-party signals to employers that individuals have a certain set of skills and are worthy of hire, and we can fully anticipate that uh, that learning and instruction which prepares students to receive those degrees will continue uh, unhindered by the developments of technology to be delivered in the format of lectures. Thank you.